May we learn to see you as you truly are. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Matt, thank you for leading us in all the verses of how great they are. My favorite verse, and I sing it when I'm hiking and backpacking at times, um, when through the woods and forest glades you wander, and then it talks about looking to up from the mountaintop below, and, uh, but we usually don't sing that verse. And so uh, thank you for leading us in that great hymn. And choir, it's great to have you back up there. Uh, helping us as we worship the Lord Jesus Christ and appreciated your special so very much and your sacrificial service on Wednesday nights in preparing for worship. We've been touring through Asia Minor the last number of weeks as we have studied seven cities and seven challenging letters that Jesus wrote to churches in those cities. Today we find ourselves... On our last stop, as we come to the city of Laodicea, Pliny said Laodicea was a most distinguished city. And indeed, it was a very distinguished city, and I think for several reasons. One, it was a very, very wealthy city. It was the banking center of Asia Minor. When Cicero was touring through Asia Minor, he went to Laodicea to cash his letters of credit there. So there was a lot of money and a lot of flow of money in Laodicea. It was the center of a very special manufacturing industry. They manufactured a very high-grade, black, uh, glossy, outer woolen garments. And so that, you know, there's a whole business there. So you had the ranchers in that area who raised the sheep, who had the black wool, and they had to have employees and shepherds. And then you had those who were in the manufacturing industry who had to go out and pick the sheep, and then the sheep had to be sheared. And, of course, then the wool had to be processed, and then it had to be made into various garments, and there were the retailers who sold it. And I suppose they probably marketed these special uh, fashionable woolen, glossy garments all over the region. And then there was a medical center, yes, in Laodicea. And they were famous for making this special eye salve that supposedly would help weak and uh, failing eyes and diseased eyes, different kind of eye diseases. And people would come from literally all over as if you would travel to, say, the Mayo Clinic or somewhere like that. People with eye problems would travel to Laodicea and and buy some of this, I'm sure, very expensive eye salve to try to help their eyes. Jesus Christ is the Lord of history. He knew the history of Laodicea, and we can see in the body of this letter that the history of this city comes into play in the letter. Jesus knows the history of every city. He knows the history of every church. And he knows where they intersect. And he knows the prescription, therefore, for his kingdom work in every church, in every city, in every locale. So we begin reading in chapter 3 of Revelation. I begin in verse 14. And I've simply called this the church that made Jesus sick. Verse 14, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write. Angel, of course, means messenger, and as we have established, that would be the pastor of the church. And we read in chapter 1 that Jesus holds the pastors in his hands. I think about why, why wasn't the name of the pastor included here? Well, I think for several reasons. We have missionaries today. We were visiting with Dan and Laura Rogers about their daughter and a husband who are missionaries in a far part of this world. And when they have letters and emails that come back, often if they're in dangerous places that are non-Christian environments, they have code names and, and code words so that they will be protected. 
No doubt Jesus knew the name of the pastor, and, and I have no doubt that John knew the name. But my guess would be it was because of the protection. But God holds the pastors in his hands. And so the letter would be dictated from the risen, ascended Lord who appeared to John, and John would write the words down, get the letter to, to, the, to the pastor, and he would share it with the church. And then Jesus identifies himself. In today's letters and culture, we identify ourselves at the end of the letter. But when you think about it, it makes a lot more sense to identify yourself at the beginning of the letter, doesn't it? And in every case, Jesus identifies himself. And you can learn so much about Jesus Christ just by studying how he identifies himself in these seven challenging letters. Jesus said of himself, these are the words of the amen. We say amen after our prayers. Let it be. Truly. It's like when you send a text message in all caps, YES, with exclamation points. Jesus is the answer to your prayers and my prayers. He is the exclamation point to everything in this universe, in this world, in your life, and in my life. He is the true one. He is the one we lean on and look to. He is the amen. And then Jesus identified himself as the faithful and true witness. We've seen throughout this study several times that Jesus was faithful. He's faithful to you and me, trustworthy and loyal, even when we are not faithful to him. There's not a lot of faithfulness in our world today. Not among employees and employers. Not among professional sports teams. Not among church members, not among husbands and spouses, not in relationships. There's just not a lot of loyalty. But Jesus Christ is faithful, totally reliable, dependable, and loyal, and he's faithful to you and me when we are not faithful to him. But here, he applies that word faithful to being a true witness. He says, I am the amen and the faithful and true witness. A witness tells what they know, and he is the true witness. You know, there are first-hand witnesses, and then there are secondary witnesses. Jesus is the first-hand witness. If you go back to, to Revelation and chapter 1, and you look at verse 5, and the Scripture says, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. And then Jesus, the true witness, said of himself in verse 18, I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I'm alive forever and ever and I hold the keys of death in Hades. He's saying, look, church, I'm telling you the truth. I died. I was buried. I rose again and ascended on high. I was dead, but now I'm alive forever and ever. Everybody has a testimony. Everybody has a witness about how you came to faith in Christ. This is Jesus' testimony, his witness. It's personal. It's firsthand. He says, I'm the one who was dead, and now I'm alive forever and ever. When you have folks in your life that you're praying for to come to faith in Christ, remember that Jesus is the true witness. We're so limited. I've learned hard lessons in sharing your faith over the years. You can't argue people into the kingdom of God. You can't present facts to somebody who's intellectual and try to convince them that they're going to come back with other facts. But I've learned to pray, help me to do what I can in planting seeds. And Lord Jesus, you're the true witness. Through your word, through your spirit, through circumstances, reveal yourself and draw that individual to you. He's the true witness, faithful, true witness. And, 
And I love this. He is the ruler of God's creation. So that verse we sang, Matt. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 tells us he not only created all things and holds all things together, but here he rules creation. He is in charge. He rules from the farthest, uh, darkest corner of the universe all the way out to the farthest star, to the coldest planet, to everything on planet Earth, animal life, plant life, your life and my life, everything, he rules and he reigns. We don't. We may think we do, but we're not in charge. He is the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, and he rules over his creation. That's the kind of God I want to rule in my life. Amen? The one who rules everything. Well, he goes right into the body of the letter, and he begins with a complaint. So I have to warn you. <laughs> These are very tough words. Jesus Christ takes the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and he goes after this church. And it's not a pretty picture. So he begins with a complaint in verse 15, as he has in every challenging letter he says, I know your deeds. And then he writes that you are neither cold nor hot. Now, I have to stop there because when I read that, when I think about people uh, being involved in something, if you think about them being cold, um, you think, well, they're indifferent. They're really not all in. If they're hot, you think about, I think about them being passionate and all in. And if I think about somebody being in the middle, I think, well, okay, I'll, I'll take that over being cold and indifferent, right? That's the way my brain thinks. Jesus Christ doesn't think that way. In the next phrase, Jesus says, I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are, what's the word? Lukewarm neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. The church that made Jesus sick. If you've been around me much, you know that I, I, I'm a Dr. Pepper fiend. I could drink two a day, but I don't. I don't drink one every day, and I don't even drink one every week. But that's my go-to drink. And... When I have a Dr. Pepper, I, I prefer it not to be in a can. I like it in the bottle. And, and I will typically take my Dr. Pepper and I will put it in the freezer. I don't want it frozen. I don't want a slush. It's okay if it has just a little bit of ice in there, but I want it cold. And then I take it out, and I'll drink it, and if I get tied up or on the phone or busy or watching TV, I, and it gets from being very cold to sort of cold, certainly if it gets to be lukewarm, I'm not drinking it. I'm putting the cap back on, and I'm putting it back in the freezer because I want my Dr. Pepper cold. I'm still old-fashioned. I drink hot coffee, black Nothing in it, strong and hot, right? I don't know about all this, you know, these frappuccinos and cold drinks and all that. I don't know where all that came from. I don't know what that's all about. But when I brew my coffee in the morning, this is, the, this is no pastor, you know, parable. This is the literal truth. I'll go into the kitchen, and I'll hit the button for brew, and then I immediately turn on the hot water over the sink, and I'll take my mug, and I will fill it full of hot water, and I'll hold it there for a minute, and I'll pour that hot water out, and then I'll put hot water in it, and I'll let it sit there while the coffee pot is brewing. And then when it's done, I will pour out the hot water out of my mug, I will pour the coffee into the mug, and I'll go to the microwave and nuke it for 15 seconds. 
literally true, isn't it? And if it gets anywhere close to not being hot, I'm either not drinking it or I'm going to nuke it again. I want my Dr. Pepper cold and I want my coffee hot. And Jesus said to this church at Laodicea, spiritually, you're like a lukewarm Dr. Pepper. Or a luke or lukewarm coffee. And I can't stand it. Self sufficient, self righteous, complacent, compromising. Well it continues. We we gotta keep going here. Um he said you know, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth, but he's not through. He takes his sword up and he says, You say I'm rich and have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. They may have met in one of the, the buildings that manufactured this glossy black wool, or maybe they met in one of the, the buildings where they manufactured this ISAV in the, in the medical area. Maybe they had their own building. But can you see, I imagine this church was full on Sundays. And they pro- I don't think they were back row Baptists. I think they sat up front in their glossy black wool fashionable garments. Their Sunday go to meeting best. Some of the owners of the manufacturing plant and managers were in that church, and maybe those who were workers or employees or owners or partners in the medical industry. Let me tell you about Laodicea. In A.D. 61, there was an earthquake that leveled the city, and Tiberius Caesar pledged support from Rome to help rebuild the city. And the leaders of Laodicea said, nah, keep your money. We don't need it. Can you imagine a city in America being hit by a tornado or a hurricane and the president declaring it a, a disaster area so they can get federal funding and the city, the city leaders saying, nah, Washington, we don't need your money? It would never happen. Laodicea rebuilt their city with their own money. They were indeed a wealthy city. They were rich. And Jesus said, you say I'm rich, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor. You see where the history of the city intersects with the history of the church and the body of this letter. And Jesus says, blind. And you go, yeah. People in the medical industry there thinking, Jesus, don't you know about our ISAV? And naked. Front row, prominent citizens in their glossy black, and the pastor reads, naked. And they're like, what are you talking about? You know how much this cost? Scathing words. Well, what about the command? By the way, I got to tell you about an experience that Levon and I had. And this is, I mean, I still have nightmares about this. When I was in seminary, I got invited to preach at First Baptist Church. I probably, somebody's probably from there that's here. I probably shouldn't say it. Well, anyway. First Baptist Church welder. I'm thinking, you know, weekend pastor, this would be great. Never heard of welder, Texas. But we drove there from Fort Worth, and we met an older lady who was on the committee and at the little hotel, really the only thing there. She was in her Cadillac, checked into our little hotel room, and, and then we went to this lady's house. 
and it was one of those historic homes that had been remodeled, and everything was like in order. And so we went into her home, and we began to visit. And after a while, some of the other ladies came. They were all widow ladies, and, or I think one of them maybe was married, as I remember right. And they were all driving Cadillacs. True. And this lady took us on a tour of the town, <clears throat> and, and she kept telling us as she took, took us on this tour about their stained glass windows. This was a dying community. They had a sausage plant. I don't know if they still do or not. And all, all they could talk about was how those handful of ladies had raised, had given $8,000 to replace the stained glass in their sanctuary. And we drove across the tracks, and she said, it, it, essentially, now we had a pastor that came over here, and, you know, he got some of these black kids to come to our church for Bible school. And, and we, we really don't need that to happen again. They, they worship their own way. Can you, can you imagine? And Levon and I are sitting there in our early 20s thinking, man, what kind of movie is this? Finally made it to the sanctuary, and they, show, they talked forever about their stained glass windows, that they had an education building <clears throat> that was falling apart, and they took us to their parsonage where we would stay for the weekend, and uh, it was in disrepair. And the lady, they were bragging about their stained glass windows and their money and driving their Cadillacs. And, you know, there were several issues with the house. And the lady that took us on a tour says, oh, it just needs a little elbow grease. In other words, it's good enough for a young couple like you. We pre I preached on Sunday morning and somehow managed to get through Sunday night. And so they wanted to meet after church, and we just wanted to leave. And so we met on the first row, and they essentially offered me the job. And I was like, oh, i got to think about this. And we got in the car and literally looked at each other and said, we're never coming back to this place ever again. Sorry if you know somebody from there, but that's a true story. And I still have nightmares about that. Wealthy, self-sufficient, proud, but doing nothing for the kingdom. Well, here's the command. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. Now they're thinking, do you know how much gold I have in the bank here? Gold refined in fire is what? Pure gold. It's been melted down and, and the impurities have been strained out of the ore. And so when it's what is left and solidifies is pure gold. They were wealthy materially and financially, but they were utterly destitute spiritually. Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And, and then he goes on to say, so you can become rich. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, because spiritually they were poor, and white clothes to wear. How do you think that went over with those who were wearing the fashionable black wool clothes? At this point, the pastor was saying, hey, gang, I, it, this, I'm just reading the letter. I'm not saying this, right? I'm just the messenger. I love you. These are not my words. Keep paying me. 
white clothes. Go back to, to up in chapter 3 to verse 4. The letter uh, to the church at Sardis. Sardis. You have a few people in Sardis, verse 4, who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in, what's the word, church? White. For they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. They had the best clothes money could buy. Fashionable black woolen outer garments. But they needed to be dressed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So you can cover your shameful nakedness. When Russell was in high school, he was in this play called The Emperor's New Wardrobe, Dress, something like that. Clothes, crazy. There we are in this auditorium, high school auditorium. It's a large auditorium. It's full and, you know, stage, lighting, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, if you know the story, you know the emperor is naked. But, you know, he's going around like he has on these new clothes. And because he's the emperor, everybody's like, oh, it looks wonderful and everything. And, at the, you know, at the end of the deal, he gets his bubble pop. Well, guess whose son was the emperor? And there's Russell on stage in nothing but these bright boxer shorts. And I'm like, he's your son. I, you know, I'm wanting to crawl out of there. I'm like, stick to football and baseball. I can't handle this, you know. Spiritually, the church at Laodicea, they were naked. Oh, and by the way, put some salve on your eyes so you can see. They couldn't see spiritually in front of their noses. They had no spiritual vision. They had no vision to reach the city. Verse 19, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. See, there's always hope. There's hope for every individual, hope for every church, hope for every person. And it's found through repentance. When we repent of our sins, when a church says, look, we've been less than what Christ would have us to be, and they repent and turn to the living Lord, when an individual in their lives, no matter how broken and sinful they've been, when they repent and and acknowledge their sin and confess their sin and that they turn from their ways to the power of Christ, then then that gets the attention of the, the grace and the power and the love of Jesus Christ. And He forgives. And He restores and He revitalizes. Repentance is such a is such a wonderful word because it means there's hope, there's opportunity. When Howard falls and fails, I know that the, the path forward is down on my knees in repentance because of the grace and power and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And so the tone changes, and he, he calls the, the members of this church to simply repent. And then we see the council. So Revelation 3.20, you've heard before, used evangelistically. And I think it definitely can be, it is applied there to the individual. But this is the sad part. This verse was written to a church. The Lord spoke these words to a church. And the picture is that Jesus Christ is outside the church at Laodicea. This perhaps ornate sanctuary or building and pack the pews and people in their their finery and Sunday go to meet in black glossy woolen outer garments. And Jesus says to them, here I am. Hello. I stand at the door and knock. 
If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. You, you, you see, Jesus was not in this church. He was on the outside. They had left Jesus out. They were nothing more than a wealthy, elite social club. And without Jesus being in the midst, that's all a church is. John 15, that great passage, I'm the vine, you know, you're the branches. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will do what, church? Bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Jesus pleaded with the church at Laodicea, let me in. Let me in. In verse 21, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Kings rule from their throne. Solomon had arguably the most ornate throne of any king ever. But here's the throne of heaven and the throne of the universe. And to sit with Jesus Christ on the throne, church, means that one day, one day, how exciting is this? We will reign and rule with Him. That's our future. That's our glory. That's our hope. That one day we will be with Him and we will be, we will be His servants fully and completely and totally. And we will reign and rule with our King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. I mean, how cool is that? I mean, talk about having a lot to look forward to. And victorious. Victorious. We may lose in this life, but in Christ, we are the victors, more than conquerors through Him who loved us. We are victorious not because of anything in us, but because He won the victory through His death, burial, and resurrection. And in Christ... There is victory. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What is the Spirit saying to West Oak Woods this morning? What is the Spirit saying to you as a member? What is the Spirit saying to you in your relationship with Jesus Christ, in your walk with Him? May we all and I always include Howard, may we hear this morning what the Spirit is saying. Lord, we love you and we praise you. Lord, though these words are, are very difficult and hard to hear, Lord, they're also words of hope. When we turn to you in faith and when we re repent of our sins, then, then you forgive. And and there's victory. No matter what, who we are, what we've done, in you there's victory through your power and grace and through your gospel when we turn to you. Lord, it's never too late. You are the living Lord. You are the one who saves and rescues every individual soul. You're, you're the one who is the church's only hope, the church's the head and Savior and the church's foundation in all in all. You are the one who brings totally, completely life out of that which is dead. You did it with Lazarus. You came to life again. You were dead, but now you are alive forevermore. Nothing is impossible with you. And we have a living hope, Lord, because of you. 
So, Lord, I pray you would fill us with your mighty power and your grace. Challenge us and give us the the humility and the grace to respond to your challenge in a way that would allow you to move in to our lives in a fuller and more powerful way so that you would get glory and your kingdom would flourish. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Matt's going to lead us as we come to our hymn of commitment and an opportunity for all of us to pray about our relationship with Christ, an opportunity for you to come and move your membership to West Oak, an opportunity for you to come and kneel at the front and pray. Maybe if you're here this morning and you say, hey, you know, I'm not sure that I'm a Christian. I'm really not sure about all that. And I think Christ is knocking on the door of my heart. Come on, let's talk about it and pray. And you can live here with a living hope because we worship a powerful and victorious Savior. Let's sing.